A Letter on Political Debate by John Newton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To the Reverend D. W. Dear and Reverend Sir, the kind present of your book and your intention in addressing your sermons to me by name deserved a more early acknowledgment. I am pleased with every mark of regard from a Christian brother, though I could have wished not to be held up to public notice, and Mr. J., who likewise meant well, has made the business a little more awkward to me by styling me doctor, an honour which the newspapers informed me, for I have no official intelligence, has been conferred upon me by the College of Princetown in America. However, by the grace of God, I am determined not to assume the title of doctor unless I should receive a diploma from a college in the new settlement at Sierra Leone. The dreary coast of Africa was the university to which the Lord was pleased to send me, and I dare not acknowledge a relation to any other. I need not express my approbation of your sermons in stronger terms than by saying that I have seldom met with anything more congenial to my sentiments and taste. I read them with great satisfaction." though i have very little time for reading had your whole volume consisted in such sermons i should have gone through it much sooner but your lectures on liberty though ingenious and well written were not so interesting to me it was therefore longer before i could find leisure to finish them and this has occasioned the delay of my letter for i thought it would be premature to write till i could say i had read them i hope i am a friend to liberty both civil and religious but fear you will hardly allow it when i say i think myself possessed of as much of these blessings at present as i wish for i can indeed form an idea of something more perfect but i expect no perfection in this state and when i consider the lord's question shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this i cannot but wonder that such a nation as this should still be favoured with so many privileges which we still enjoy and still abuse allow me to say that it excites both my wonder and concern that a minister possessed of the great and important views expressed in your two sermons should think it worth his while to appear in the line of a political writer or expect to amend our constitution or situation by proposals of a political reform when i look around upon the present state of the nation such an attempt appears to me no less vain and unreasonable than it would be to paint a cabin while the ship is sinking or a parlour when the house is already on fire my dear sir my prayer to god for you is that he may induce you to employ the talents he has given you in pointing out sin as the great cause and source of every existing evil and to engage those who love and fear him instead of losing time in political speculation for which very few of them are tolerably competent to sigh and cry for our abounding abominations and to stand in the breach by prayer that if it may be wrath may yet be averted and our national mercies prolonged this i think is the true patriotism the best if not the only way in which persons in private life can serve their country for the rest there will be always dead to bury the dead the instruments whom the lord employs in political matters are usually such as are incapable of better employment all things and persons serve him but there are services under the direction of his providence which are not good enough for his own children they belong to a kingdom which is not of this world they are strangers and pilgrims upon earth and a part of their scriptural character is that they are quiet in the land the reasoning for a more equal representation in Parliament is specious, but while infidelity and profligacy abound among rich and poor, while there is such a general want of principle and public spirit among all ranks, I apprehend that whatever changes might take place in this business, no real benefit will follow. The consequence would rather be the introduction of perjury, bribery, drunkenness, and riot into towns which have hitherto been more exempted from them than the boroughs as the numbers of buyers increased so would the number of those who are willing to be sold and i know that many judicious people in birmingham and manchester are so sensible of this that they would be sorry to have elections among them though there are exceptions i have so poor an opinion of the bulk both of the electors and the elected that i think if the seats in the house of commons could be determined by a lottery abundance of mischief and wickedness might be prevented and perhaps the nation might be represented to as much advantage by this as by any other method but these are not my concerns 
the position that if the body of a people are aggrieved they have a right to redress themselves must be much limited and modified before i can reconcile it to scripture i am not fond of despots but i think if ever there was one upon earth nebuchadnezzar was a despot whom he would he slew and whom he would he kept alive whom he would set up and whom he would put down daniel five eighteen and nineteen yet jeremiah declares that the lord had given him this despotic power and had commanded all the nations to serve him surely if you and i had been there knowing what we know now we should not have disputed this command nor have excited the people however oppressed to shake off the yoke which god himself had put upon them and if for our sins the lord should put us under the power of the russians i should rather look to him than to man for deliverance i think a heathen said the day which deprives a man of his liberty robs him of half his virtues if i was a heathen i should say so too but the gospel teaches me otherwise the apostle expected that believing servants who at that time i suppose were chiefly bond servants or slaves would act from nobler principles and aim at a more sublime end than the conception of philosophers had ever reached to that they would act from a regard to the glory of god our saviour and to the honour of his gospel titus two ten one timothy six one and elsewhere he says one corinthians seven twenty one art thou called being a servant care not for it but if thou mayest be made free use it rather if divine providence offers you a manumission accept it with thankfulness if not it is but a trifle to you who are already the lord's freedmen and in your most servile employments if submitted to for his sake you are accepted of him no less than if you were placed in the most honourable and important stations the christian however situated must be free indeed for the son of god has made him so on the other hand you and i dear sir know how much they are to be pitied who are frantic for what they call liberty and consider not that they are in the most deplorable bondage the slaves of sin and satan and subject to the curse of the law and the wrath of god oh for a voice to reach their hearts that they may know themselves and seek deliverance from their dreadful thraldom satan has many contrivances to amuse them and to turn their thoughts from their real danger and none seem more ensnaring in the present day than to engage them in the cry great is the diana liberty may you and i labour with success to direct them to the one thing which is absolutely needful and absolutely sufficient the Sicinians are rather the most forward in this cry which i fear will have a baneful influence upon the power of religion among the more evangelical dissenters an agreement in political sentiments produces much cordiality and intercourse between those who in point of doctrine have stood at the greatest distance and already in some pulpits pro dolor a description of the rights of man occupies much of the time which used to be employed in proclaiming the glory and grace of the saviour and the rights of god to the love and obedience of his creatures as to the revolution in france i suppose no humane person was sorry when the bastille was destroyed and the pillars of their oppressive government shaken the french had then a great opportunity put into their hands i pretend not to judge of the political merit of their constitution but if i approved it in other respects i durst not praise it so strongly as you do while i knew it was planted in atheism and has been watered with deluges of human blood while i knew it began in insult to christianity and aimed at its abolition however their first admired constitution is now at an end and has no more force than the repeated oaths by which they bound themselves to maintain it and now not content with pleasing themselves they are aiming to force their schemes upon the surrounding nations i should call this quixotism in the extreme if i did not consider them as saws and hammers in the hand of the lord so far as they are his instruments they will succeed but not an inch further their wrath shall praise him to the full extent of its acting and be subservient to his designs the remainder of it he will restrain and when he maketh inquisition for the blood they have wantonly shed and for their defiance of his great name neither their phantom liberty nor their idle voltaire will screen them from his notice i am sorry for your severe censures on the present administration for when i compare the state of the nation in the year seventeen eighty three or at the time of the king's illness with what it is now i cannot but think that the providence of god raised up mr pitt for the good of these kingdoms and that no man could do what he has done unless a blessing from on high had been upon his counsels and measures i speak simply having nothing to hope or as i think to fear from men in power 
I am not concerned to vindicate the conduct of ministry in the lump, but believe, though it be easy to draw up theories and schemes in the closet, which may look very pretty and plausible upon paper, difficulties will occur in the administration of a great people, which can scarcely be conceived of by persons in private life. And, with respect to Britain at present, I believe, if the prophet Daniel was at the head of our affairs, or if all our ministers were angels, the corruption and veniality of the times would labour hard to counteract their designs. There is no new thing under the sun. When I read Sallust's account of the Jugurthine War, I seem to read, mutatis montandis, our own history, the wealth and luxury which followed the successors of Lucullus in Asia soon destroyed all appearance of public spirit in Rome. Our acquisitions in the East have had a similar effect. I know some persons who, after giving full proof of their incompetency to manage their own private affairs, after having ruined their families by dissipation and stained their characters by fraud and bankruptcy, have presently set up for national reformers. I am very sorry they should seem to have the sanction of such a name as yours." I know not even the names of the gentlemen who compose the society of the friends of the people, and consequently have no prejudice against their characters, but you yourself are sorry and seem surprised that they should adopt an eulogium upon Mr. Payne. I am sorry likewise, but I am not surprised. Expede Herculem. I rely more upon this feature than on all their declarations. When you say that allowing them to be men of penetration, nothing more is necessary to establish the purity of their intentions, it sounds very strange to me when I consider it as the sentiment of an author of the two sermons which I have read with so much pleasure. Surely it cannot accord with your knowledge of human nature. When our Lord was upon earth, he refused to be a judge or a divider, and he said afterwards, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then would my servants fight." I should think, as Peter thought, that if anything could have justified resistance in a disciple, that was the time when Jesus was apprehended by wicked men to be condemned and crucified, but his master rebuked his zeal. I think that, as Christians, we have nothing to expect from this world but tribulation, no peace but in him. If our lot be so cast that we can exercise our ministry free from stripes, fines, imprisonment, and death, it is more than the gospel has promised us. If Christians were quiet when under the government of Nero and Caligula, and when persecuted and hunted like wild beasts, they ought to be not only quiet but very thankful now. It was then accounted an honour to suffer for Christ. Of late the rights of man are pleaded as a protection from the offence of the cross. Had I been in France some time ago, and if by going between the contending parties I could have reconciled them, I certainly ought to have done it but to take a part in their disputes myself, and to become openly and warmly a Jacobin or a Fulier, would be ridiculous in me if all my connections and interests were in England, and I expected in a few weeks to leave France forever. In this view I consider myself now, if I had wisdom or influence to soothe the angry passions of mankind, whether Whigs or Tories, I would gladly employ them, but as to myself I am neither Whig nor Tory, but a friend to both, I am a stranger and a pilgrim. My bolitevma, my charter, my rights, my treasures are, I hope, in heaven, and there my heart ought to be. In less than a few weeks I may be removed, and perhaps suddenly into the unseen world where all that causes so much bustle upon earth at present will be no more to me than the events which took place among the antediluvians. How much, then, does it import me to be found watching with my loins girded up and my lamp burning, diligently engaged in my proper calling, for the Lord has not called me to set nations to right, but to preach the gospel, to proclaim the glory of his name, and to endeavour to win souls. Happy is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. In the hour when death shall open the door into eternity, many things which now assume an air of importance will be found light and unsubstantial as the baseless fabric of a vision. I know not whether the length and freedom of my letter may not require an apology, as much as my long silence, but as I give you full credit for what you say of your candour towards those who differ from you in sentiment, I am the less apprehensive of offending you. From the perusal of your sermons I have conceived a great respect and affection for you. Though we may not meet upon earth, I trust we shall meet where all are perfectly of one mind. In the meantime I set you down in my heart as a friend and a brother. As I was forced to write, both duty and love obliged me to be faithful and free in giving you my thoughts. I recommend you to the care and blessings of the great Shepherd and Saviour, and remain for your sake, Reverend Sir, 
your affectionate friend and brother, J.N.